Hello. Okay. In this one, I'm just going to try to like speed through David Duke's secret behind communism. I'm just going to try to point out the places where I think he got stuff wrong or he just like totally mischaracterizes, misquotes, makes shit up. Pretty dumb read overall and like pretty easy to like dismiss a lot of stuff. I mean, there's some truth in there, but anyway, let's get into it. Uh, he mentions Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I know like that's where you get a lot of the Solzhenitsyn quotes, but I think you can look at Solzhenitsyn's own work for his like understanding of the JQ and like Bolshevism and communism and stuff. You can read certain passages from 200 years together and it seems like he has like a more nuanced view than like David Duke would have you believe. Uh, so I'm not sure if these quotes are like accurate or if Duke's just lying, but I don't even really care too much about that because he's just one guy, but I just think it's interesting how he like brings him up and he continuously like brings him up throughout the uh, book. Uh, he mentions how like Hollywood never like focuses on the Holodomor. I would just say that's, I mean, yeah, there are like are a lot of Jews in Hollywood, that's for sure. But I think it's also because of the Holodomor, like there's a debate of whether it's like an intentional genocide or not. And there is so much like crazy shit going on during that time period. Like, I don't think there's many movies, at least in America, made about like the Great Famines in China either or the other famines that happened in like the USSR or just in general. Um, I don't know many movies about like the Armenian genocide. So, I mean, you can complain about like all the Holocaust movies, I guess, if you want to, but I just don't think this is like a intentional thing to like ignore the Holodomor. He shows these six figures that were um, listed in Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book, uh, the Gulag Archipelago. But the point of these six figures isn't to show like the main leaders of the Gulag. Uh, Kogan and Berman definitely were leaders. And then Yagoda was the leader of the NKVD, which was the agency where the Gulag administration was like underneath. So like it was the NKVD, I guess, was like the overall umbrella organization, the secret police. But Frankel, like he was also important in like how the Gulag developed, but I wouldn't call him like one of the main like bosses. Uh, he certainly never led it. Rapoport, like even from the book uh, that Schultz Nielsen wrote, like he's just shown as like one of of the top people in the Baltic, the White Sea Canal project, um, but he's not like a main Gulag boss of like the whole Soviet Union or anything. And then I don't know why he even brings up or why Duke thinks Aaron Soltz is like even remotely like related to the Gulag. He was just like this lawyer in the Soviet Union, and Solzhenitsyn only brings him up because he went on like a fact finding mission at the Gulag and to show that Soltz like didn't report what was going on or something. But Soltz like was not like a Gulag boss, so that's like a really misleading thing. And like those pictures get shown around a lot, but I mean if you just look at the actual like context of the book uh, gulag archipelago like that's not those pictures aren't meant to show like these are the six main leaders of the gulag like that's definitely not true I think it's kind of ironic too he brings up uh ynet news like an article on stalin's jews he makes this whole spiel about like oh like the jewish zionists like media they don't want you to know about this stuff but they're like quote-unquote happy to reveal it to their israeli readers because ynet news i guess is like an israeli magazine or newspaper but I mean, it's an it's an English newspaper in Israel. So I mean, obviously, it's geared towards like at least English an English speaking audience. So I mean, if they were really trying to hide it, why wouldn't they do it in Hebrew? And the article obviously wants to focus mainly on Jews because that's like the whole point of the article. But it's not like meant to be this thing where like, oh, you go to and Tagnovich, I guess, or like take all the blame for this, uh, these events and these deaths. I mean, clearly, there are other people involved. As you can see from my other video, or like later on in this video, people like Pavel Postashev, Molotov, Belitsky, who was the head of the NKVD in Ukraine specifically at the time. So basically, Duke's whole thing is just name dropping people, but I mean, I could name drop like other like non Jewish people. So obviously, there's a mix of people involved. It's not just like one or two people. And as I keep repeating in like most of my videos about this issue, like Stalin was at the end of the day, like the dictator, like the main leader. And he was an ethnic uh, Georgian, which is like a total minority in the USSR. So anyway, uh, he brings up Ilya Ehrenberg, who was a propagandist for the Bolsheviks or whatever the Soviets during World War II. Um, I actually remember I did in my last video, he was actually like anti-Bolshevik at first, like during the revolution. But over time, like because of like the white army pogroms and shit, he moved over to the Bolshevik side. Um, anyway, Duke only focuses on Ehrenberg. He says like he was like this horrible propagandizer against the Germans and like wanted like atrocities committed towards the Germans. I definitely think he like said bad stuff about German soldiers during this time. But like, again, it was a war time. There was other propagandists in the USSR. Um, obviously, there was Nazi propaganda geared towards like everyone else and it was pretty nasty as well and also some stuff uh some claims are made about Ehrenberg that just like aren't true but like I'll agree that he like used harsh language but it was a wartime so I don't really see the point in like bringing this up he of course has to bring up Israel even though Israel may have had like some socialist and even like 
proto like communist in the beginning uh, sympathies, but certainly not like throughout most of its history. It was like labor, labor Zionism and stuff, Bundism, but it wasn't like for like out and out communist. Um, and like he always has to critique like and bring up Israel for whatever reason, even though that like really has nothing to do with communism. I mean, most communist states disliked Israel, like, so I don't know why he even brings that up. Okay, so that was just like the intro or whatever. Chapter one, he starts off with the NAACP. Uh, you can just look up the NAACP like founding. I mean, yeah, some Jews were involved. Mostly it was not Jewish people involved. He's like mad that people like Marcus Garvey or like the Nation of Islam weren't listened to. But I mean, the Nation of Islam like thought that white people were devils and like wanted their own land and they wanted reparations in the US. So I think it's like weird when these like white Nats, like they want to ally themselves with the Nation of Islam more, but the Nation of Islam has like way more like demands than like liberal kind of assimilationist black people and others. So uh, he talks a little bit about how he like got woke to the JQ stuff um, and like communism. Ironically, he brings up a book by Barry Goldwater and Frederick Charles Schwartz, both of whom are Jewish and like anti-communists. And you see that a lot. Like, yeah, there's a decent amount of communist Jews and there's a decent, decent amount of anti-communist Jews. Nathan Coffinus's default hypothesis basically explains that. But anyway, he doesn't really seem to like acknowledge that. Uh, he brings up like Robert Wal uh, Wilton's uh, weird claim that like out of the 384 commissars, there were two Negroes and Chinamen and Armenians, but most were Jews, blah, 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 which makes no sense. Uh, the whole term commissar, it's like going to the U.S. and saying, like, there were 300 officials ruling. Like, this is a very generic term. What you have to look at for the USSR is basically the Central Committee and the Politburo. And I did that in a video. And also you can read Lucian Wolf, like the actual guy, the, ath the actual British author. He, like, talked a little bit about Robert Wilton and, like, discusses how he's just, like, basically just making shit up. Um, I've never, by the way, like, read anything about black people or Chinese people who were... Uh, leading in the Soviet Union. Definitely Armenians, but I mean, that's like totally made up. Like Negroes and Chinamen, like that's, come on, that's not serious. Uh, he later talks about how Lenin, um, Lenin was a quarter Jewish, I'll admit that, but he didn't ever really like know that. Uh, there's evidence to say that he like never knew of his Jewish ancestry and it's only a quarter. Um, he definitely did not speak Yiddish and I don't believe he married a Jewish girl. So I think that's just a lie. I mean, if someone comes up with evidence, you can post it in the comments. I'll try to read it. Like, I would like to be informed on that, but I haven't come across anything like that. Uh, he also goes on to say that uh, Moises Yuritsky was the first Cheka chief. That's not true. It was Felix Drzinski, the Pole. I did a video on this. Um, and also, Yuritsky got, like, assassinated super early on, so he didn't even have that much of an effect. Um, although the Red Terror did begin after his assassination, but, I mean, you, I don't know if you can really blame that on the dude. He got shot, so... He was dead. Also, also he mentions uh, Sver Sverdlov too, and Sverdlov was never like a leader of the Cheka or anything like that, so he's just making stuff up. Uh, he brings up Ehrenberg again. Uh, there was no position as uh, propaganda minister, so he just makes that up. Uh, he shows those six people again from uh, Gulag Archipelago. Kind of just like portrays that the Cheka and KVD, all those secret agencies were just like run by Jews. I did a video on this. Definitely not true. I mean, definitely a lot in the NKVD, like that part I'll concede was like pretty Jewish, but like before and after, not so much. And it's just kind of, again, like hyper uh, focusing on like one group, cherry picking. Uh, he brings up a stat from, I don't know what his actual name is, I.A. Kurganov. He says that 66 million died at the hands of communists between 1918 and 59. That number, like, I'm not trying to be like, because I know people, if I like dispute numbers, they'll just say like, oh, the Holocaust was made up or whatever too. Like those numbers suck. Like whatever. I mean, you can say whatever you want, but I'm just saying the whole like communist, like 100 guerrillion number. I don't believe that's true. I think a lot of that comes from like the Black Book of Communism or whatever it's called. And a lot of it is like counting uh, would-be births and stuff. Like, I mean, 66 million dead, like, where is he? I just don't know where he's getting that number. And Kurganov has been um, criticized before. So, yeah. Oh, and also, like, the six people that he mentions, um, like, half of them got purged in the Great Purges. So it's kind of, like, silly to say, like, oh, they were in the Gulag, like, the whole time. Uh, the Gulag system, that's not true. You can see, like, post, like, 30s, the Gulag system was run by, like, ethnic Russians. And that's even when Solzhenitsyn was in the Gulag. So... Solzhenitsyn was not uh, in the Gulag during the time of, like, Jewish control of it or whatever. And obviously when I mean Jewish control, I just mean, like, the top Gulag administrator and, like, majority-minority part of the NKVD. But it's not like every single person running shit was a Jew. Like, you have to go to each camp and, like, it just depended. I mean, Latvians, again, were still overrepresented at the time, but we can move on. Um, he makes the claim that Jacob Schiff from New York financed the Bolsheviks. That's not true. He helped finance Kerensky, uh, but definitely did not help finance the Bolsheviks. Uh, you can, like, research into that. There was a book written about the Bolsheviks and being financed by Wall Street, and, like, the author even has an appendix talking about how, like, Jacob Schiff was not involved in that. So you can just read that book if you want, like, a scholarly opinion. Uh, he talks a little bit about the history of Russia and, like, the Pale of Settlement and stuff. He, like, portrays the Jews as, like, 
Jewish extremists for not like necessarily assimilating into Russian culture. Um, there was like, I mean, I don't really know how they were supposed to assimilate because the whole Pale of Settlement, like the point of it was to close them off from other parts of Russia. Um, so they were like basically enclosed. And he talks about how like education was like given uh, for free to the Jews, but like that wasn't just to the Jews. Like education was just in general um, made available to all, not just Jewish people. You can read like books by John Clear and stuff about uh, Russian history and the Jews. I mean, it's just like a long history and just kind of portraying it as like, oh, Russian, like the whole, the czar was trying to be nice and the Jews just like were dicks. I mean, that's definitely not the case. And obviously he doesn't mention like pogroms and stuff like that or anything. So um, he also tries to portray the Jews as like being the leaders and like the majority of the uh, revolutionaries in Russia at the time. He brings up uh, Gershoni or Ger yeah, Gershuni. Um, as if he's like the only leader of that certain revolutionary faction. It's just like, again, not true. It's just cherry picking one person. Um, I would say Jews were overrepresented, but it depends on the time period and they were never the majority like ever. And again, if they're overrepresented, it's because of like dealing with the anti-Semitic policies of the czar usually. He brings up the 1905 revolution and like basically just tries to blame it all on uh, Trotsky. Um, he doesn't bring up Viktor Chernov, who was also like really influential. And the whole revolution started because of Father Gabon's like strike protests that led to Bloody Sunday. Um, and like the whole, I mean, it wasn't just like the Jews churning up hatred uh, against the Tsar. I mean, the Tsar was unpopular. They had lost the Russo-Japanese War. Um, there was various things going on. It wasn't just like Jewish subversion from Trotsky or whatever. He then talks about the 1917 revolution, which overthrows the Tsar. Again, just tries to make it into like this Jewish thing. But people like Trotsky and Lenin, uh, they're like by this time exiled from the country anyway. And the people who end up overthrowing the Tsar are more like liberal social democrat types. They're not exactly like uh, the cream of the crop, like Bolsheviks or revolutionaries. They're more just like moderates, I guess, for lack of a better word. And again, there's this general strike activity upset over the war, but definitely like the main leaders of the provisional government, the government that replaces the czar, um, is certainly not Jewish. Uh, as I said, Kerensky's gone Jewish, and um, just in general, Jews were not really uh, represented even that much in the new provisional government. So if anything, I think like a Jew like Trotsky had way more influence in the 1905 revolution than in the 1917 one. But then obviously later when the Bolsheviks take over that, uh, you know, then he obviously has a role in that. But anyway, he talks about the origin of the Bolsheviks. Um, he claims Bira Zasulich was a Jew. Uh, I didn't find any for, or I didn't find anything to confirm that. I don't think that's true. And also doesn't mention another leader, uh, Vasily Ignatov, in the group uh, Emancipation of Labor, uh, founded by, like the main founder being Plekhanov, who was not a Jew, so Gentile. So three-fifths Gentile finding or founding whatever of the Emancipation of Labor group. He brings up Iskra, one of the early uh, newspapers of the Bolsheviks. Nothing he says is really wrong in this, except again saying Zazulich and Lenin's wife were Jewish, but besides that, pretty much accurate. Although he neglects to mention that the paper was funded by a Russian old believer called Sava Morozov. So, I mean, the funding of the newspaper is from like a non-Jew. He brings up Ravichi Dello as well as, as he puts it, the only other revolutionary paper at the time, which I'm not too sure about that. I mean, I just looked up like real quickly. There was one other one, Ravichi Missile, I think it's called. And I don't think any Jews were associated with that one. And that paper actually sub subsumed Ravichi Dello and both uh, took the economist position that Lenin uh, criticized. And even when I looked at Rabochi Dello, I couldn't find Theodore Don, the guy that Duke says was the editor. Uh, there were Jews involved in it, but again, it's kind of like both papers weren't necessarily like dominated by Jews or anything. And also the papers lasted like a couple years and ended. And um, it's not like Lenin ended up getting along with a lot of these people. And I mean, he eventually split from the Mensheviks like Martov and Plekhanov. So, I mean, I guess it's interesting that Martov uh, had some influence early on, but by the end of the, uh, I mean, at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, he totally had no influence. Uh, then he goes on to talk about the Fifth Party Congress in London. Um, he gets the numbers pretty much right in terms of the amount of delegates and the certain factions there. I don't know exactly what he means by like led by, like, I mean, I guess those were like the most prominent members. Um, he seems to imply that Denishevsky was Jewish. I looked him up. I don't know if he is, but the other people like that seems pretty much legit. Although I will say the central committee that was elected from this Congress, I wouldn't say it was like dominated by Jews, probably disproportionate, but that's kind of always the case. And then also 
Uh, you can just look at the Bolshevik and Menshevik uh, delegate numbers in terms of like population percentages and the Jews are like, they don't dominate again, but they are overrepresented. But again, that's just something to know. And it's always important to know that the Bolsheviks eventually split from the Menshevik um, and the Mensheviks like are against the Bolshevik revolution. So I don't know why they always, like it doesn't really, the Mensheviks and other factions of the Russian Social Democratic Party, they don't end up really mattering as much. It's mainly a Bolshevik thing that turns into the Bolshevik Revolution. So whenever I analyze this kind of topic, I mean, I mainly just look at the Bolsheviks. You can look at other factions too, but I really care more about like who actually came to power. For the uh, 1903 Congress, he also makes a claim about the second Congress in 1903, says that like mainly it was like Jewish intellectuals there. I don't know where he gets this from. He doesn't cite anything. Uh, I looked up some of the delegates and you can also look at the central committee that was voted upon. Um, it's hard to like find out if any of them were or were not Jewish. Some like you could tell, I think based on Wikipedia and then others, it's just kind of like, like maybe he's just thinking if they end in like an itch or a ski or something. Um, but from what I could tell, like, I don't think that's true. So yeah, basically, I don't think that's true based on just like looking up the delegates um, and then also looking at the central committee that was voted upon. And either way, it doesn't like matter too much because again, uh, the Bund and the Mensheviks, there's issues with the Bund, like the Bund wants to be more independent and Lenin wants there to be like a more like hierarchical top down kind of thing. But the Mensheviks and Bund want more of like a federated structure. This is also the 1903 Congress is where the Mensheviks and Bolsheviks kind of like appear um, as two different factions. And the Boond is like argued over. The Boond leaves, eventually comes back. But like at the end of the day, uh, the Bolsheviks eventually become like their own thing and their own independent group. And like the Mensheviks and Boond like leave the Bolshevik party or Russian Communist Party. And then while we're on the topic of like origins of Bolshevism, it is good to look at the kind of historical controversy over whether or not Lenin was this kind of like orthodox Marxist or more of like a Russian populist type figure. A lot of scholars would say like the Mensheviks had the more orthodox line that uh, Russia couldn't overgo or undergo a revolution before it went through like a capitalist phase and Lenin wanted to like skip the capitalist phase just to like briefly summarize. I know people could argue the finer points. Um, and there's just like a lot of people who would say Lenin took more influence from uh, earlier Russian populists rather than uh, Marx and other like orthodox Marxists. So it's just good to note that. Okay, and then uh, he also looks at different uh, like newspapers and says like that like all the editors were Jewish or that um, Trotsky was an editor, blah, 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 for like Pravda specifically. Um, if you actually like look at these newspapers, like I just looked them up on Wikipedia, like it's not really like accurate to say like, oh, he was like the one editor. I mean, they had like so many different editors and like it just depended on the time period. So yeah, Trotsky was an editor of Pravda, but there was like plenty of other people. So that's again, just cherry picking. Uh, he also claims Alexander Kransky who led the provisional government um, was Jewish, but there's no evidence of that. Uh, he just kind of like implies it based on the name, but I haven't seen any evidence of that. And there are various like articles and websites like declining that, even though people would make that claim even back then. Um, but people made the claim that certain people were Jewish and certain people weren't Jewish like all the time. Even like people would say, uh, some people said Trotsky like wasn't a Jew and that Lenin was like a real Jew, but that Trotsky was like a man of the people. People would say things like that. So yeah, I mean, that kind of accusation like was just thrown around all the time. But for Kerensky, it's definitely not true. He then uh, goes on to mention the Sixth Party Congress. And this was at this point, this uh, Congress for the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party was only Bolshevik. They had cut off ties with the Mensheviks, like a all Bolshevik type of thing. Uh, he quotes from Trotsky's book on Stalin, uh, an appraisal. Uh, I think that's what it's called. I forget the full title. Um, but he quotes some things from Trotsky. Um, and I looked at those quotes and they're like in the book and stuff. And basically he is trying to say that Trotsky is saying that basically Jewish people like, and he doesn't say it directly, but Jewish people like Kamenev, Zinoviev, Trotsky himself, and Lenin were like the most important. Um, it does say that like they got the largest number of votes to be in the central committee, but I don't, I wouldn't really say that means they were necessarily like, the most important, um, especially Kamenev and Zinoviev, who later on were like two of the people who voted against the Bolshevik coup in the first place and uh like lenin like they were like basically kicked out of the party for a short time due to that or left the central committee because of that and uh, also speaking of trotsky uh he was a menshevik before this and only joined uh, the bolshevik party uh recently at this time and stalin was a bolshevik longer than trotsky 
And Duke's whole point is like Trotsky is trying to paint Stalin as like not an important figure. I mean, I obviously Trotsky would say that, and I mean you could do that, but I mean the fact of the matter is Trotsky was a Menshevik beforehand, and Stalin was a Bolshevik the whole time. And also like people like Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Lenin weren't at the actual Congress because they were like in hiding and stuff. Uh, and Stalin was was actually the one who um, delivered the report to the committee or to the uh, Congress. And Duke also goes on to say like, oh, uh, here we have named the most prominent figures of Bolshevism, Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Luna Trotsky. I mean, from that same thing he's quoting, it also mentions Colin Tai, who is not Jewish. Um, and if you're going to be consistent too, Kamenev was only half Jewish. Um, I know like Duke likes to point out people who are only half this, half that. So Kamenev was only half Jewish as well. But just to wrap that up, I mean, Stalin was not like a nobody. Trotsky was a Menshevik beforehand and Zinoviev and Kamenev have voted against the Bolshevik coup later on. So this whole idea that like they were the top guys, I mean, they were important, but it's kind of arbitrary to like decide who's the most important. I then moves on to the revolution itself. Um, the military revolutionary committee talks about how Kamenev and Sverdlov were the first two presidents. That doesn't mean they were like, it's not the same notion of president obviously in the US. Uh, Lenin was obviously like the leader. Um, and during this time, like obviously there was the civil war going on and technically like power hadn't been consolidated. Position was held by like two Russians, uh, including Mikhail Kalinin, Kalinin, not sure how to pronounce that. And he was uh, chairman or president, whatever you want to call it for like numerous years, uh, way longer than these two. But again, I wouldn't even really focus on this position because it's just Again, the whole point of like the Bolshevik party was like a top down kind of thing. So anyway, just like to say, it, it's not like they weren't important, but when people like use this language, like, oh, he was the first president, it just sounds like a greater thing than it really was. You just kind of have to like look at the intricacies of the uh, government system and style that was like in place. And it kind of changed over time because it was like in flux a lot. Uh, he goes on to talk about how the constituent assembly broken up by the Bolsheviks, which is true. Uh, and this move was like totally not or favored by the Mensheviks or the Jewish boon or like basically any Jewish uh, people because the provisional government under Kerensky basically gave uh, equal rights to all its citizens regardless of religion, race, whatever. Um, so Jews like were not big supporters of the Bolsheviks. You can look at my other video to see that, but kind of ironic there. Um, a lot of Mensheviks and even like some cadets uh, like troops uh, were Jewish who like defended the constituent assembly from the Bolsheviks. Uh, he has another little tidbit about uh, Moisey Aritsky, who was not the leader of the Cheka, that was Jurjinsky, the Pole. And again, he wasn't really in power long enough to really like start the uh, persecution of the Orthodox Church. I'm not saying the Orthodox Church wasn't persecuted at the time, but that really came into gear later on. And he also makes a, a stupid statement that like, oh, like all the rabbis were left alone. Uh, that's not true. Religious Judaism was like not looked upon kindly and was overall like abolished throughout time. Um, yeah, like religious Judaism was not, did not maintain itself during the Soviet Union. Um, and then he says that one of the first laws passed by the Bolsheviks was to outlaw any anti-Jewish activity. The only thing I could find from this or for this, was that Lenin uh, did put, like, pogromists to death, like, people who wanted to, like, enact pogroms, but that's because, like, pogromists were essentially just murderers, like, they just murdered people, so yeah, like, the death sentence was put upon them. And then there was another law, but it discriminated against any, like, nationalistic, like, racist, religious uh, discrimination, um, and it wasn't necessarily, like, putting people to death, but it was just about, or making it, like, against the law to, like, uh, persecute people based on religious or ethnic identity. Uh, he goes on to point out that the Military Revolutionary Committee was three-fifths Jewish, and the Politburo, uh, the first Politburo was four out of seven. Um, I think the Politburo number is accurate, um, and I don't know about the military MRC necessarily. I think there's different ways to count that. I mean, I just went on Wikipedia and found, like, a bunch more members than just five, and they weren't all Jewish. But um, I'll just, like, accept that for the sake of argument. Um, but both, like, the Politburo uh, would change, like, pretty rapidly. Like, it didn't, that same Politburo, those numbers changed, like, throughout the Civil War. Uh, the military, the MRC didn't last very long, and eventually after like a month or so, got uh, subsumed by the Central Committee, essentially. So uh, just during this whole time, it was like a very tumultuous period where there wasn't a lot of like stability. So like, number, like I don't know, the amount of people involved in a certain group or whatever would change. And um, it was just kind of hectic. So I think it's not always... I mean, it's fine to look at these things, but it's a bit misleading to like use them as a... Uh, fodder for arguments and stuff. He quotes uh, Winston Churchill's article, Bolshevism and the Jews, or whatever it's called. Yeah, this was a real article. Churchill, you know, had those views. I would just point people to Lucian Wolf, another British 
author at the time who kind of dispelled the whole notion that it was the Judeo-Bolshevik myth. So I would just point to his stuff if you want like another British opinion on that. Uh, he quotes the Robert Wilton thing again. So anyway, basically Wilton gets this totally wrong. You could look at the Central Committee, uh, he gets that totally wrong. The Council of People's Commissars, there were only 17 uh, commissar positions, like based on the constitution, you can only call yourself a commissar if you're in one of these positions. And he gets these like names all wrong and stuff and just calls people Jewish. You can look that into that, I'll show some pictures. And then when it comes to the Central Executive Committee, uh, that was basically like their version of Congress. So it involved like hundreds of people. I can't look into each name, but I mean, that's not hundreds of names anyway. And I have stats on like some of the Congresses and I mean, Jews were not like the majority or anything. And then he gets to the Extraordinary Commission, which is just the Cheka. Uh, he gets Jurjinsky right. And then again, he like messes up uh, Peters and Lotsis. He calls them Lithuanian, but they're Latvian. And um, I already did a video on this and like there were, you know, top Jews in the Cheka for sure, but I don't know where he's getting all these names from again. I mean, basically he's just like making up people or making up names or just like taking random people who aren't really important and just like attributing importance to them. Like this, it's kind of like difficult to really look into what he's even saying because I mean, it's just totally like, there's no citation, there's no nothing. I mean, obviously Duke's citing him, but what does he cite? Like, he's just, like, listing random things, so. Um, but anyway, moving on. He goes on to say that a German social democratic movement was, like, dominated by Jews. Again, it's kind of like a similar thing with Bolsheviks and communism. Like, yeah, overrepresented, but weren't dominant. Especially after the fall of, like, the Spartacus Rebellion that was, like, put down by social democrats. Uh, page 112, he says Karl Liebknecht is a Jew. That's not true. Um, he does talk about the Hungarian Revolution led by Bela Kuhn. I will say that's like was a pretty Jewish thing in Hungary, but um, it didn't really last too long. It lasted like a year, but I mean, he's not really lying there. Uh, he starts getting into uh, Trotsky's downfall, Stalin coming into prominence, which again, if there was like some big Jewish conspiracy, I don't know why Stalin was able to get the upper hand on Trotsky or whatever. Uh, page 119, he gets into Lazar Kagnovich um, and like seems to put all the blame of the Holodomor and all the deaths in the Soviet Union and the purges of the 30s on Kagnovich, which I find really odd. As I've shown in the last uh, couple of videos I've done, I mean, certainly other people were involved in the Holodomor and Yezhov was like the director of the NKVD or head of it, the NKVD at the time of the purges. And that was when the great purges were going on in the late 30s. So again, it's just like super selective to like only choose Kagnovich for this. And then also he, uh, refers to the uh, Kiev court decision that I mentioned in one of my previous videos um, and, and like he's using this as uh, evidence that Kagnovich was guilty for the um, Holodomor but like the Kiev court decision names like, six other people involved uh, number one being Stalin and I think it only names like one other Jewish person and the rest are just like Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, he then goes on to blame the Katyn massacre on Kagnovich which I think is really odd. Yeah it talks about the Katyn massacre that was done by other people in the army uh, Kagnovich was not like necessarily like a leader of the army or anything like that. Uh, he cites this book by the supposed nephew of Kagnovich. I'll just say that there's some controversy around that. I don't know if that book is necessarily true or accurate. I think a lot of people were trying to like make money off of supposed connections to whatever famous people from the Soviet Union. So I'll leave that there. Uh, he goes on to uh, say that the talk about the Holodomor as a genocide. Uh, ironically, from the Polish Jew uh, Raphael Lemkin, uh, who I guess I don't know if he coined the term, but he just like popularized it. So he's like using a Jewish guy's work to like argue that the Jewish Bolsheviks, like whatever. And then he also like compares it to Palestine, which I think is like offensive in very <laughs> like many ways. I think for, first to like the people who died in the Holodomor. I mean, if millions of people died in the Ukraine. I mean, certainly not millions of people have died because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I mean, that's just, like, bullshit. And, I mean, I'm not going to deny Palestinian suffering, but, I mean, there was ethnic displacement of Palestinians, and then there was ethnic displacement of Jews in the Middle East, like, as a whole. So, I don't know. I mean, I just don't think you should say, like, were the... Were the Jews of the Middle East genocided because they were more or less, like, kicked out to Israel? I mean, I don't know. I, I think if I use that logic, you know, Duke would say something like, oh, you're just, like, playing the victim again or whatever, so. And I'm going to stop it here just to make sure the video is under 30 minutes, but uh, you can see part two in a little bit. Thanks.